Okay, so today we're going to be focusing on cytoskeleton. Up till now, we've been, you know, we've talked about the DNA, we've talked about how we got from DNA to RNA and then translated into proteins. We've looked at a bunch of different types of proteins up till now and how they interact with the membrane and how they're responsible for transferring signals, taking signals from outside and using them inside to make responses by the cell. So now we're going to be looking at another structure that is very, very, very important in maintaining all these uh, actions in place, and those are our cytoskeleton. And so with the cytoskeleton, we already know, you know, we talk about how it helps us maintain our structure, right? But it is a very, very, very important component for the function as well, because it helps proteins get moved from one place to another, right? It helps vesicle transports, protein transport. It helps cell division, a lot of different actions that are responsible that happen only because cytoskeleton. Um, we are gonna be talking about the three main components of the cytoskeleton, uh, which are your intermediate filaments, microtubules, and the actin. And then we are going to be talking about how them combine together, help us perform an important function in the shape of muscle contraction. <coughs> So here, um, obviously, you know, like I said, we've always talked about cytoskeleton being an important structural component of our system. It's kind of like that scaffolding that keeps the uh, allows the cell to keep its shape and also helps it move around. It also helps us organize all the internal organelles and keep them in their place. So it makes a place for them to be anchored to right in, internally uh, so that they can be where they need to be and work how they need to work. And so here you have an example of that. Uh, just these are fluorescently stained um, proteins that are part of your cytoskeleton structure. The nucleus here with the stain in blue is stained with DAPI, which stains specifically your DNA. And then you have your green, yellow, and the red fluorescence that is marking the is part of your cytoskeletal structure from your microtubules to microfilaments and the actin fibers. <laughs> so just to give like an overview of the three different types and how they're gonna function, like I said, you have these three different main components. You have your intermediate filaments, microtubules and actin filaments. Um, all of them at the end of our day are the fil filamentous proteins of different types in their final structural form. The difference is that microtubules is made up of these little uh, proteins that are globular in nature by themselves, but when they come together, they make these long rope-like structures. Um, so you have your intermediate filaments. These are rope-like fibers that kind of uh, work with each other to create a meshwork all around the nucleus, all around the outer surface of the cell, uh, like the boundary of the cell. And they are the main part of like the nuclear lamina. And then your cortex structure, a lot of those they are responsible um, for with these intermediate filaments. Um, they give the cell obviously its main shape and kind of strength to maintain that shape. So they are kind of these things holding that shape together so that you can put pressure on it and still maintain it in its particular environment. The second one is your microtubules. Uh, these are hollow cylinders at the end of the day because of the way they are organized. So like I said, there are these little globular proteins that come together to create these hollow tube-like structures. They usually have a central command center where they come from, they originate from. Uh, centromere is an example of that structure that is present within our cells. They are really responsible for some uh, very specific functions, right? Uh, we'll talk about them in uh, how they help with the cell cycle, for example, specifically, and then also in muscle contractions. And then finally, you have your actin filaments. Uh, again, these are polymers of small little globular proteins that come together to create these rope-like structures at the end of the day. Um, and they are dispersed all over the cell, uh, especially along the, again, the lamina of the, uh, not the lamina, but the cortex, the cell cortex, 
and they are going to be connecting with other proteins and other structures helping to create that roadway that uh, makes things work. So both intermediate filaments and actin together create the highways in the cell that are used for all kinds of different organelles and proteins to move around from one place to another. Okay, so we're gonna start with intermediate filaments. Hmm. Um, so intermediate filaments, uh, there are two different types. There's some that are going to be present in your cytoplasm and there's some that are a part of the nuclear structure. Uh, the nuclear uh, lamins are actually all that little kind of cortex-like structure right underneath the nuclear membrane. And that is uh, going to be made entirely of intermediate filaments. And in the cytoplasm, they are going to be part of your connective tissues, muscle fibers. They are going to be part of your nerve cells to maintain its structure. Um, specifically, keratin filaments are part of your epithelial cells, right? They are also part of your skin, nails, hair, all those fibers as well. And then neurofilaments are specifically in nerve cells. And then you have these vimentin and vimentin related filaments that are present in all other cells aside from these two. How they are made? Uh, so a single polypeptide chain of your intermediate filament is just this long rope-like structure. So even in the tertiary form, that's what it is. It does not have a lot of secondary structure within it. It stays as that long, long rope-like structure. What it does is that it um, creates dimers initially. So it binds with other polypeptide chains, other monomers of itself to create these coiled, coiled structures. These coiled coil structures can interact with other dimers, right? So once you have these dimers, they can interact with each other and create secondary um, <laughs> bindings between them to create tetramers or multiple multiples of tetramers, right? Uh, these different polypeptide essentially structures, and they usually will lie anti-parallel to each other because of the different bindings that are happening all along these. These are secondary bindings, right? These are all like hydrogen bonding related. They don't form in single strand. They only form once you get these dimers. So the one quaternary unit, right? Quaternary structure unit of these intermediate filaments is this coiled coiled dimer, okay? Um, individually, they're just uh, not going to be fun. <laughs> and these dimers will then, again, be staggered in uh, anti-parallel um, organization against each other, and you can have multiples of them to create thick bundle or small, you know, thin bundle, depending on what the needs are. <laughs> what do they do? Well, they are going to, like I said, create this network of roads and highways all along the cell. Um, and so that's what you would see all along it. And these, depending on how thick those fibers are, those bundles are, they will be very strong or they will be a little bit less strong, especially in the boundary, along the boundary or in any kind of pseudopods or whatever. Uh, you see those are going to be in thicker bundles to maintain that shape. And then you will have thinner bundles all along the cytoplasm. And that's gonna be where the other um, organelles are anchored, where other parts are moving along them. Um, they are also part of those gap junctions that are connecting cells together. So any type you have those tight junctions or desmosomes that are connecting adjacent cells, they will have very, very thick bundles of these intermediate filaments that are anchoring them together, creating a really tightly stitched structure, essentially. You know, so it's like sewing them together with that uh, structure on both sides. Um, so here you can see those as labeled in blue. And you see, you can pretty much see the entire cytoplasm, right? You see the cell body. If you just stain for intermediate filaments because they are spread all around the cell cytoplasm, right? So you can essentially see them spread all over the place. The only place that you do not see it is where, what's there? This big hole, it's the nucleus, exactly. So you have nothing in the nucleus and then everything around it is going to be there. Now they help provide, like I said, strength to the cell and help it work against any kind of pushing or mechanical stress that might be put on top of it. <laughs> now, 
On the nuclear side, like uh, we talked about that there are other types of intermediate filament like structure that are part of the nuclear structure as well. They don't go all around the nucleus. They are only part of the boundary, right? And so that's the nuclear lamina. It's kind of like the cortex at the cell membrane. Um, so it lays this kind of structural support right underneath the two nuclear membrane, the bi uh, nuclear envelope, and they help to maintain it, its shape and structure within there. And you can kind of see that with the big boundary on these nuclei, right? Okay, so how are they linked and how they are kept in place are with the help of proteins. So here you have that structure. So this is your nuclear envelope. You have the double layer, right? The bilayer of the double bilayer of the nucleus. This is a nuclear pore. Here is your nuclear lamina that has those intermediate filaments. They are anchored to this space with proteins and the cache domain proteins that are both going to work together in what we call the perinuclear space. That's the space in between the double bilayers, right? The two double bilayers. Um, and this space, you will have these particular structures interacting with each other. So based on that, what type of, uh, what properties might you find in the R groups of the protein structures in this space? Would they be hydrophilic, hydrophobic, positively, negatively charged, acidic, basic? So remember, there's a double, by layer structure. So what would you expect these protein, uh, these amino acids to be? Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hydrophobic and hydrophilic. What would you consider, uh, what would they be rich in? Rich in? Yeah, what type of amino acids? Hydrophobic or hydrophilic? The inside your cells. The ones in here, in this little space. Oh, my God. Good. And the reason for that is what? Do you want to tell me? Um, because you're you're both trying to get away from the yeah, outside area. So you end up like outside area. It's like the same Which thing as like the tails. It's like the same thing as tails. You're on the right track. That's fair. <laughs> so what's what type of uh, the lipid bilayer itself? Is it hydrophobic or hydrophilic? The lipid bilayer itself, yes. This um that is hydrophilic. It's hydrophobic. The inside of it, like the two yes. tails that connect are hydrophobic. Exactly. So yes, so that's something to be mindful of that they are yeah hydrophobic. So that's why most of those amino acids that are going to be in that structure are also going to be. Nature, so that they can be embedded within it and be stable in that environment. Um, and then you have your cytoplasmic side and your nuclear side. And in either side of those, you are going to have in the nuclear side, it's going to be attaching to the nuclear lamina itself. However, on the cytoplasmic side, it doesn't attach to a single protein. It attaches to many different types of proteins. And what are these proteins part of? Are all part of the cytoskeletal structures. So you have actin, right? Actin fibers. You can have microtubules that are binding to it. Um, if it's binding to microtubules, usually it is also going to have these motor proteins attached to them that are actually anchoring those microtubules to it. Collectin is another cytoskeleton structural protein that we've talked about before as well. Um, and that is, again, so on the outer surface, you're going to have in the cytoplasm, a lot of these structural components that are going to be anchoring to the nucleus with the help of these proteins, with the help of the cash domain proteins. And inside, in the nuclear side, it's going to be binding to the nuclear lamina, which is made of intermediate filament. So they are together going to create this strong structure to maintain their you know, uh, space in their environment. Lectin specifically, aids in binding to the uh, intermediate filaments and clumping them together and clustering them together. Yes, sorry. Okay. 
Good morning. Hey. A little bit. Yeah. I broke it. <laughs> but I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> you know what? I want to make this thing right here. No, 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 no. You I know. You're so annoying. It's not for I hate you. <laughs> so annoying. No. <laughs> Yeah. Y'all haven't gotten a sticker in a minute. I haven't got a sticker. Really? She gets a good money. Well, they they can be inside the nuclear envelope, but remember, intermediate filaments are also in the cytoplasm as well. So they're on both sides. They're on both sides. In the nuclear envelope, they're right underneath the nuclear envelope, creating that kind of a scaffolding for the nucleus. They are not in the nucleus itself. But these type of bundling, this happens both in inside. It doesn't, it's not just in one place. No, it's binding. Uh, so it's with the help of proteins that are present there. But it can, you know, th these proteins are going to be present all along. So you'll see them as, you know, kind of these yellow little dots happening around them. So they are helper proteins that help to anchor it. But think about these as kind of like zip ties. The anchor proteins or the plant? Together. Together, okay, okay. Together, the anchor proteins and the, uh, the little plectin, they act as zip ties, bundling them and holding them together in those places, in those little cross structures, yeah. to keep them all anchored where they need to be to create that scaffold. They just work as a team. Yeah, they're working as a team, exactly. So <clears throat> these plectin, like I said, yeah. they are going to aid in that bundling of intermediate filaments. And so you'll see a bunch of them anchoring together kind of along with those helper proteins. And those helper proteins, there are a couple of them that can be part of that story. Uh -huh. I was just going to ask, is plectin a part of the intermediate, intermediate filaments or is it a separate? No, it's protein? a separate protein, completely separate. It's not part of the original intermediate filament. It's just a single polypeptide chain that, you know, uh, creates that dimer. That's it. Right, and the, then those dimers can be working anti-parallel to each other, and you can have lots of them hanging together or individual rope-like structures together uh, individually. Yes. What's the difference between the green and the blue? What's the difference between it's the the green, it's the blue, the intermediate, and the green microtubules? Oh. So in this particular case. There is no difference, but there will be time. There, yeah, there will be time. It's basically the thickness of the ropes. How many proteins are getting bundled together? But in most cases, you'll have like different types of cytokalin structures staying differently as well. Uh, but that's what they will be doing is that they are going to be, like you see here, you have these plectins that are binding to the cash domain proteins, for example, up here. Um, and then that's going to help to anchor this together. Uh, plectin can bind to other helper linker proteins as well. And those proteins are then going to be bound together to this structure to maintain its space. Questions? Not yet? Good morning. Huh? Good morning. Good morning, dear. How are you? I but I'm here. Yay. How are you? I'm Feeling better today. That's good. That's good. I'm happy. <laughs> okay, microtubules as our next ones. And we'll come back to you know all these different stained parts of the structure as we talk about them. 
because you will see that, you know, like microtubules are going to be interacting here too. And so we'll build on that and make it more complex as we go along. So microtubules. Microtubules um, are extremely important in many, in cell cycles specifically, but many other such structural uh, functions as well. Uh, movement, anything that involves movement of cells in one way, shape, or form will typically also require microtubules in some uh, during those processes. So you have it, for example, important in dividing cells where you have these central organizing center in the shape of the centrosomes that start building these um, microtubules to create that spindle fiber. And then they help to create those poles during cell division and then uh, divide them eventually. In ciliated cells, where again, you're gonna be getting these microtubules in those cilia, right? Or even in flagellar structure, again, um, you are going to have these basal bodies that are kind of like the centrosome in the uh, sense that they are the ones where these originate from and they move into the cilia specifically. Um, they have an orientation which way they move um, as they build and as they grow. And so those are two important places where they are uh, going to be there. Another part is just part of the structural support system again. Similar to intermediate filaments, you can have microtubules in certain parts of the cell as well, acting as further support system. They are going to be usually responsible for movement of particles, or usually these could be small organelles like lysosomes or such, or it could be vesicles that they are transporting from one space to another. And those can be many times responsible for those movements with these microfilaments. So microfilament oh, or microtubules, sorry. <clears throat> microtubules are made of a protein called tubulin. The tubulin comes in two different isoforms, alpha and beta, and those together create that tubulin. Uh, yes? I'm sorry, you said they're responsible for the movement of what? Cells. And organelles within the cells, or vesicles sometimes, right? So they are responsible for movement of things and cells themselves. Um, so internally inside the cytoplasm, anytime you have those little vesicles going around the little, you know, with more protein walking around, you'll have these polymerizing and depolymerizing to move them from one place to another. Um, moving the chromosomes during cell division, moving the cell through the environment with the cellia and flagella, all those things. Pseudopodia, you know, pseudopodia will have actins too, though they'll have other structures. But a lot of movements of things involve microtubules specifically. So the basic unit, a monomer of a microtubule, is this tubulin dimer, which is made up of the alpha and the beta subunit coming together. So this would be a quaternary structure, right? A single unit. Now, once they are built, they can then be made into different structures and shapes. They can be made into little circular structures. They can be made into hollow tubes. They can be made into all types of things. Um, and what they are start off with are these protofilament. A protofilament is just a long string of these alpha and beta subunits coming together and making this long chain of them, right? <clears throat> so on these filaments, anytime you're building them, it's going to have a plus end where new tubulin dimers are coming in and attaching, and it's gonna have a minus end where they are coming off and dissociating from that structure. So if you are at the plus end, you are going to be watching them grow. And if you are on the minus end, you are going to be watching them shrink because they are going to be coming apart on the minus end. Make sense? Okay. Um, so in, for example, lumens and stuff, right, you'll have these ring structures that form, and then along those ring structures, every single one of them is going to create this protofilament to create these hollow tubes. A single hollow tube of this structure is uh, typically going to be 25 nanometer in diameter across over here, this space, this hollow space inside that creates that lumen space. It's going to be 25 nanometer uh, wide. 
So that's the thickness of that uh, center. Now, how do they form? They form, like I said, they need to have a central organizing uh, space that they originate from. Uh, so we are gonna look at a centrosome as our first example of how they start. Within the centrosome, you have these little structures called centrioles, um, and you have a pair of them sitting inside them. And then you have along the centrosome matrix, the structure that's called the centrosome, several little pore-like structures. And these pore-like structures are the nucleating sites <laughs> that are made of another isoform of tubulin called gamma tubulin. And these are gamma tubulin ring complexes. So these are gamma tubulins coming together to create a single ring-like structure. Nothing else, right? No long filaments, nothing. It's just a ring of them creating a pore like structure. And these centrioles are where you're gonna get all the other components built to be taken out into these tubes. So the centrosome is your big microtubal organizing center in animal cells. And inside these centrioles are where they are going to start off. Um, so the microtubules grow out of these <laughs> rings, gamma tubulin rings, that's where they will come out from. So they get started at the centrioles and they will come out using these ring-like structures as their site to come out as the pore for them. Um, and they will build out. And so all of these that are coming out, that's their plus end, right? Because they're polymerizing and elongating as we speak. <coughs> now, once they start to build out and they are out of those pores, each one is going to slowly shift. They are uh, not stable in that conformation, in that plus conformation. So there's this dynamic instability so they can switch from positive to negative. So they can start to, they can continue to grow or they can start to shrink or then they can continue to grow again. You know, so they can go between growing and shrinking depending on the environmental stimuli and what else is happening around them. So the centrosome, to begin to come out of those pores, they have to be polymerizing. They have to be at the plus end. But once they are out, they can um, be plus or minus. They can polymerize or depolymerize. They will continue to do so. So each one of them is independent of each other. Each one, each one of these microfilaments, these profilaments is going to be either polymerizing or depolymerizing until or unless it reaches what we uh, an anchoring point, and that's provided by these microtubule capping proteins. Um, if they find one of these and they anchor to it, they bind to it, they become stable and they no longer shift. They will just stay where they are and they will be the size that they are. But those that do not anchor to it will continue to go through this plus minus situation until they anchor. So during cell division, it becomes important because you have certain filaments that are going to anchor to, to those capping proteins and keep that structure, and others that will continue to polymerize and depolymerize in order for chromosomes to move outward. So the ones that are attached to the microtubule capping protein are stable. The ones that do not attach to anything are unstable and will switch between polymerizing and depolymerizing states. Yes. So if they're depolymerizing, does that mean that they're shrinking? shrinking but they're breaking apart? Yes. yes. So the microtubule fiber, those little, you know, dimers, they're coming off of. Them. And what would be the purpose of that? Oh, lots of them. We'll talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Very important. Can't function without it. That's how they move. And that's exactly how they're moving things or, you know, uh, moving the things from one place to another, for example. So here is a growing uh, microtubule. Now this also involves GTP activation, right? It's an energy using process. So the tubulin dimers come in, they bind these, uh, you know, the growing microtubule at the positive end with the GTP um, action. So it's GTP tubulin that comes in. They add, these are activated dimers that are coming in to bind to your plus end to the growing end of the microtubule. On the other end, when you look at the shrinking side, the GTP hydrolysis 
uh, is what is going to rip those apart and shift them out, right? And depolymerize them. So at any given time, both of these actions can be happening on a specific microtubule, but it is essentially the balance between how fast the new GTP bound tubulin is coming in versus how fast the hydrolysis is happening. That's going to decide whether the, that particular fiber is growing or shrinking at the end of the day, okay? So the protofilaments containing the GDP tubulins that are, you know, because of the hydrolysis, if you, they lose that GTP cap at the end, it's going to cause them to be released to the cytosol and be free and lose it and shrink it. And if the GTP cap is there, so you have those GTP tubulins binding in and there is a positive end because there is a GTP binding site, they will continue to grow. So all these activated, right? All these activated tubulins that are there with GTP uh, still bound to them, that essentially acts as a GTP cap to protect it from shrinking. It will continue to recruit more GTP bound tubulin into it. And when it starts to hydrolyze and separate up, that's going to cause it to uh, lose that cap and uh, depolymerize the whole so there are some really important drugs that are um, especially in the cancer world that help us um, to control cancer cells by using microtubules as their target. Taxol is one of them. Taxol binds and stabilizes your microtubules. So it's not causing any more damage to the cell. It's not doing any DNA damage. It's not increasing apoptosis. It's doing none of it but it's a very strong chemotherapy because what it does is it binds and stabilizes microtubules. And as we'll find out that cell cycle, we talked about how you know <laughs> this whole process of polymerizing and depolymerizing is how it does its function. If it is bound and stabilized, can it depolymerize or put, or yes? Move they can't. So they, they are they frozen. So they can't pull the chromosomes. They can pull the chromosomes. They can't go back to where they came from. And now they're kind of stuck in this limbo state. And they can only survive so long in that limbo state before they die. So that's what they do. They essentially kill the cell by putting it in this frozen state, in this kind of, you know, freeze. And now it doesn't know what to do. Um, similarly, you have some other ones that look at different parts of this whole process of polymerization and depolymerization. So colchicine and when venblastin, when, venblastin and Christian, again, another very strong chemotherapy, uh, they bind to the tubulin binder uh, by dimers themselves and they prevent microtubules from ever forming. So that's gonna have even more drastic effects than this one. This one's gonna be most effective if used on actively growing cells that are going through cell cycle. This can affect cells even if they are not actively dividing because there's so many other functions that the cell needs the microtubules for. And this is going to prevent those functions from ever happening, right? <clears throat> and then colchicine, again, will also bind the tubulin dimers and prevent polymerization. So both of these um, other drugs will work that way, yes? I was just telling Sandy Bush she sneezed. Oh, let's. Okay, so let's look at some functions that are done by microtubules. <clears throat> Very important. Asha. So, <laughs> first of all, microtubules organize the cell interior because they help in transport of molecules from one place to another. In nerve cells specifically, they can actually help to transport signals from one side to the other through transport of these neurotransmitters and other actions. Um, so it can move molecules to the cell body or it can move them to exon terminal, right? Again, neurotransmitters as they need to go to the next cell to uh, provide function. They can also be important for driving intracellular transport with the help of motor proteins. So here they were taking small molecules themselves, right? Here they're using motor proteins to move molecules 
bigger vesicles, for example, or bigger structures from one side to the other. Um, and this whole process is ATP driven. It's so much fun to watch and see. I love that. I love motor. Um, so yeah, so that's something that they can do as well. And then finally, they are going to be part of that whole cell division, cell structure process, which again is very important. Um, here you have a couple of examples of how they can function. Again, you can see a whole network of them all around the cell. If you look, it is a stained in green fluorescence over here, right? Um, to show how diverse they are and how much space they cover. And then in your transport system, you can see them also being very important in movement of cells through cilia, for example, right? So spore movements, for example, or anything that involves cilia or flagella. And now different uh, proteins, we are gonna look at one of that mechanism first in the shape of motor protein. So different motor proteins are going to move different types of things across microtubules. They're always going to move from the minus to the plus end in most cases. So you have your minus end of the microtubule and the plus end, which is the growing end, right? Actively growing end. And that's why it's going to move along with it. Um, and so the motor proteins, they will have different types of proteins. They will all function uh, to move different things, but there is common structure between all of them. They will have globular heads. Typically, they work as dimers, so two of them wound together. Each part of that dimer will have a globular head that interacts directly with the microtubule, and it will have a tail-like structure that is going to anchor, act as an anchor, and then they will have an adapter protein binding section on the other end that helps to bind the cargo that's going to bind directly to it. So you can have um, the cargo bound directly to that end, the top end of the protein, or you can have adapter proteins that are binding to the cargo itself. But either way, one side will have globular heads that interact with your actual microtubule. The other side is going to have adapters or a structure that will bind specific types of cargo and move it along. One of these, uh, you know, motor proteins are uh, what we call kinesins, and they are called kinesins because they use ATP hydrolysis, the phosphorylation, the phosphorylation action to do this movement. Here is another example, right? So here is a globular protein, a tail adapter protein, and this one is taking a cargo, in this case, a vesicle along again. And this one is on the cytoplasmic side. This protein is called dynin. This is, again, a very important motor protein that takes um, vesicles around one way or another. This particular protein can move from plus to minus n. So dynins are going to go from plus to minus. Kinesins will move towards the plus growing end of the protein. Yes. So they were called kin kinesins, why? Kinesins, partly they're called because they are using the phosphorylation. Anytime you're doing, you know, the whole function with the phosphorylation, we talked about those before as well. That's going to have, you know, some kind of kinesin function in it. So kinesins move from the minus to the plus end. Dynins move from the plus to the minus end. So they're moving in opposite direction. Yes. And you said the majority of proteins move from minus to plus. So yeah, so kinesins and a host of other motor proteins are gonna move from minus to plus. Dynein specifically, and there are a few other in that category that will move from the plus to minus, but majority of the transport happens towards the plus. This has a very important function, the whole movement from plus to minus, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, there's a little link to a YouTube uh, little, animation that talks about kinesin function or mechanism, how exactly it moves from one place to another. Um, but we will, well, actually, I might show you that. We'll talk about that later on as well. Let's see. Of course, first we have to watch about money making. Money making, sorry. With physical products. 
But the ATP, the whole process is driven through ATP hydrolysis, right? So each time one of the globular head has an ATP hydrolyzed into ADP, which shifts it from one spot to the next and continues to move forward yes. from that, move from that hydrolysis action. Stuff. <clears throat> <clears throat> to billions of nerve cells. And uh, if we take a closer look, a nerve cell seems to have antennas. Most of them are receivers of information, but only one is a transmitter called the axon. This axon is connected to several receivers and other cells for a gigantic neural network, the brain. Meet John. John is a kinesin a motor protein. He lives inside a nerve cell and he has a proper job. To ensure that the brain cell does his job properly, it needs the continuous flow of using the cytoskeleton. If you so with the city, the cytoskeleton inside the cell would be the roads, and the traveling proteins would be the traffic. These materials are towed by motors along the roads. And just as in real life, there are different kinds of motors and different kinds of roads. John's sole purpose in life is to deliver his cargo to a specific place in the he takes the main roads and he walks in just one spot. direction of the <laughs> John's job may seem easy, but it's not. He has to overcome a number of obstacles to ensure that the right amount of cargo arrives at the right place. To make the journey even more difficult, John is not alone. Other motor proteins ride along with his cargo. They haven't woken up yet, but that will happen soon. The journey starts in the center of the city, just like in the center of the cell. To enter the axon, John has to pass a place called the axon initial segment. In this segment, there are two kinds of cells. The main roads that John uses called the microtubules, and a lot of 
It's called acting. And here, our brave motor protein meets his first challenge. Because one of his sleeping travel companions, Myosin, has woken up and starts to cling to the acting. And there are a lot of alleys. Only fools can save John now. Fate strikes again. The other companion, Diane, wakes up and he can only walk in the opposite direction of John. Resulting in a tug of war. But there can be only one. Along the axle in which John travels, there are places called synapses. And here, the axle connects to receivers of the other cells, regulating proteins called the shots here. This traffic police makes sure that all passing traffic gets to the right destination. If John's cargo is needed in this science, he will be stopped and Iosin's taken away his load. But today, John's cargo is safe. He does not know that it's under construction, just a few blocks away. In armor of cells, the sight of skeleton is changing constantly. Roads but are also broken down. Facing this kind of obstruction, John has to find a detour. John isn't the only motor protein on the road. There are need a smooth traffic. A traffic jam due to problems during the journey may ultimately result in brain disease. Understanding the challenges John faces could improve treatment or prevention. Finally, John arrives at his destination. He has fulfilled his destiny. Seven of John's are just getting started. Questions about that? Like the cow or something? What? But that's kind of what it all the time inside the cells is this kind of tug of war, per se, but more. The type of signals that are coming in will control which protein is going to move the cargo to what destination. And sometimes you do have other types of cytoskeletal structures that come in to ship the cargo to them and move them to a different place. And we'll talk about those in muscle contraction. So here again, um, remember I talked about how it is also important, not just for internal transport, but also for the actual movement of cell itself, especially when it comes to using cilium or flagellum. Uh, cilium flagella have these microtubules arranged in a very particular way in what we call a nine plus two array. So there are nine microtubule uh, structures, these two microtubules stuck together along the outer circle and two in the center that work together and the one in the center are singlet microtubules. The ones all along the outside are two together, numbers of microtubules, right? Um, so now these little microtubule structures, these are connected to each other and to that central core, the singlet, through that are shown in blue. Then you have for the movement of these microtubules to control which way the cell is going to move or the uh, flagella or the cilia is going to move, you have these dynein arms. So the dynein arms are going to be coming off of each of the microtubules and then you'll have an inner dynein arm and an outer dynein arm. And they're only present along the outer uh, structures. 
And these within the two, you know, the doublet of the microtubules, you have an A microtubule and a B microtubule. And then all these blue structures are your linking proteins. And then a second type of linking protein, so-called, is this radial spoke that you see connecting them to the central singlets. So how do they work? Well, so remember they are in twos coming together. And again, each one is gonna have a plus and a minus end, right? Um, now they will lie uh, against each other, parallel to each other, and they're gonna move with the help of these dynein proteins and these motor proteins that are present between them. Um, and this process is gonna be through ATP hydrolysis. So the dynein is what is helping to produce this movement. Remember, dynein moves from the plus to the minus end, right? So it's gonna shift this one, you know, the microtubule A downward uh, with ATP hydrolysis and cause the other side to shift up and then continue this process. These linking proteins link them together so that they stay together. They don't slide away from each other beyond a certain point. The linking protein allows them to move only so much out and in, and that's the amount of movement that you get. So the dynein is what's going to cause these cells to move forward or bend toward the particular side, and the linkers are going to control the amount of shift that's going to happen. Okay. In other structure, uh, that is again, another function of microtubules is the movement of chromosomes during cell cycle. So there are two different types of microtubules that are gonna pre be present within the structure of your mitotic spindle. Some that are going to be responsible for causing that core structure to remain stable. And those would be attached to capping proteins. And then others that are your, uh, you know, proteins that are kinetic or microtubules that are going to be shifting. They are unstable, so they will be moving, polymerizing, and then depolymerizing to shift those my uh, those chromatids, shift those chromosomes to the opposing poles. In addition, there is a second type of cytoskeletal structure that is also important during cell division. And that's the contractile ring that forms that uses actin and myosin uh, in the center to split the cells into two individual cells at the end of cell cycle. Um, so the chromosomes are only going to be interacting with microtubules. And then your actin and myosin filaments will separate the cell, the membranes, from each other to create two separate cells. So let's see how those form. So you have, again, your centrioles inside the centrosomes that are going to start your microtubule formation. This is gonna happen when, um, you know, very early, by the way, already as the cell goes into cell cycle phases in G1 state, this is the first growth phase, you will just have a single centriole and a, you know, a single pair of centrioles inside a single centrosome. When the cell shifts to a cell cycle phase and goes into synthesis, right, when the DNA is replicated and then the G2, the second growth phase, the, as, the duplicated, as you duplicate the DNA, you also duplicate the centrosome. So you now have two sets of centrioles inside that single centrosome. And as it, the cell enters mitosis, the M phase uh, into cell cycle, the first part that happens is actually the division of that duplicated centrosome into two individual centrosomes, each with its own centrioles, that are now going to be create, eventually going to create your two different poles. Um, as they uh, separate, they start to develop the microtubules, and this is what we call aster, the in individual microtubules coming out that create the structure of aster and they start to polymerize and shift away from each other, creating those two poles. Those two poles are linked with these microtubules that are connecting the two centrosomes together, right? Through these microtubules and others that are going to be polymerizing and depolymerizing and the dynamic instability. Inside you have your nuclear envelope breaking down, the duplicated chromosomes coming together, right? Condensing. 
Now, eventually in your metaphase, you will have a stable structure where you have these kinetic or microtubules bound to the individual chromosome at the metaphase plate, and you will have the remaining of your microtubules bound to cap binding proteins, you know, essentially mitotic, uh, you know, uh, the stabilizing these individual spindle fibers to maintain the structure of that cell. Okay, you see that difference? <clears throat> now, you have uh, your continuous you know, movements happening, right? So again, individually, each one of them is completely independent of the other. Any given microtubule can be polymerizing or depolymerizing depending on its state. The astral microtubules right here, right? You see those? They are going to be part of that structure as they are developing. And then you have, these are constantly shifting. They will be continuously going to plus and minus. And then in the middle, you will have these stabilized interpolar microtubules maintaining that structural component. Um, these are stabilized by these specific proteins that bind to them and maintain them from depolymerizing or polymerizing further. And so they are going to keep that state until the metaphase of uh, all forms and you get all those proteins, uh, all those chromosomes lined up correctly. So let's look at them a little bit closer. You have some astral microtubules that are shifting constantly. You have some that are stabilized in the back attached to the uh, cap so they can no longer move. Inside in that internal structure, you have what we call the kinetochore microtubules. These are not stable. They can continuously move up in and out as well. But then you have interpolar microtubules that are stable, okay? So two different ways that you can get them stable. One is by anchoring them to those caps. And second is by these interpolar microtubules binding to specific proteins, stabilizing them in their form at that time. So the interpolar microtubules do not shift the kinetic or microtubules do shift, okay? So <laughs> there is a way for the cell to recognize when all the chromosomes are lined up completely. And at that time, you have certain proteins that happen, uh, the proteins that are activated that trigger the separation of your two sister chromatids by breaking up the these cohesive complexes, these ring-like proteins that were holding them together. So the only thing that was holding these two sister chromatids were these cohesive complex. Cohesive complex is these ring-like protein structures that are bound around, they're just kind of wrapped around like little rubber bands all along that chromosome. Um, and so there are these proteins called um, separase. This is a proteolytic enzyme that can separate it, you know, the chromatids, the sister chromatids from each other by breaking down the cohesins. Normally it is in an inactive form because we need them together. And it is kept in that inactive form through an inhibitory protein called securin. Once the chromosomes are all lined up correctly, you get an activated APC complex that is going to degrade securin by ubiquitinating it and chewing it up and through the proteosomal process. So it breaks it up. And now what you get is a free separase that is now active and ready to do its job. So it will go in and it will chew up the cohesin complex, freeing the individual chromatids so they can be separated. So far so good. Lots of things happen. So much fun. And now, once they have broken apart, you will get the movement of these. So see how these bats, right? These are connected to the plasma membrane, to the caps to stabilize them. These astral ones are shifting. Um, the interpolar ones are stable. And your finally, the kinetochore ones are shifting. But those shift doesn't do anything until the cohesin are broken down. And once they're broken down, those three, so it's gonna shift them inward. And now what happens is that as 
they, uh, as these depolymerize, these start to the back ones are still polymerizing, right? They are going to get pulled apart, leading to what we see as the separation of your two chromatids. So the kinetic or microtubules shorten, which means they're depolymerizing, right? They're shortening. Um, and they are going to drive them towards individual poles. And then the sliding force between these interpolar as they get dragged around are going to be elongating this structure and eventually pulling them apart completely. So these microtubules start to grow again once these shorten and they separate from each other. So this exact point where you have those interpolar microtubules is where the second set of your cleavage is gonna happen. This is where the furrow is gonna happen because remember, they are stuck, right? So that everything is stretching apart and this is just becoming smaller and smaller and more constricted and constricted. So it's gonna be putting uh, pressure on the cell to kind of start to create that central furrow which is where actin and myosin will then create, uh, you know, tighten up as well and separate them out. So now <clears throat> let's see exactly what happens. Where is this arising? So before I show that to you, let's go back. When you think about this structure, right? So we think about, oh, the chromosome is attached to the these microtubules. Well, they're not going to be depolymerizing back here, right? When a pro when the microtubule depolymerizes, it depolymerizes exactly right here at that central core. Well, if it does that, what happens to the chromosome? It would fall off, right? So something has to be keeping it together so it doesn't fall off. And what keeps it together is that actually the chromosome is never directly attached to the microtubule to begin with. What it is attached to is that basket-like protein complex. It has a ring of protein. It looks literally like a hot air balloon-like complex, right? Like little basket. Um, and it has these other proteins combined together, the kinetic or fibers and the kinetic or plates. Those come together to create this basket-like structure. That's what's binding to your chromosome. And where the ring is, that's what's anchored to your microtubule. So when it depolymerizes, it doesn't affect this binding. It's still bound, but the microtubule is shortening. And this particular ring shifts as this depolymerizes. It just keeps shifting forward towards the plus end. Okay? What? This is the minus end, right? This is where they're depolymerizing. So it's gonna, the minus end will shift forward. Okay. It was plus end when it was adding and then minus end when it's depolymerizing. So it shifts it from one to the other. So the plus and the minus the plus subsides, subsides? Not exactly, but it's when it depolymerizes, well, there's no more activation happening essentially. So it's all just the minus at that point because it's depolymerizing and it's going to shift towards that central core. It's just a balance, like hydrolysis versus the... Yes. So, you know, because remember, the plus end would have been up here where it started and now it no longer exists, there, right? Because it shifted as it started to depolymerize. Yeah. What? I, so... You'll see it in a second. Let's try. <laughs> I know this one's a little bit of a, you know, but it, so conceptually it should make sense. Here, let's see. Have another video for you. <laughs> so fun today. <laughs> what? It's as funny as that last one. Got to see you. Yeah, see the animation. Fun? Isn't that fun? <laughs> Big. Yeah, doesn't it look like that? Oh, the last one yeah, showing the whole thing. There we go. Yeah, I was like, what is it doing? It doesn't show the proper structure. There we go. 
Somebody else explain it better than me. The astonishing molecular machine is that create a living fabric of your body. Can you turn off more lights? Molecules. I wish they could. Like all of them, maybe. <laughs> Those two refuse to go. Really? They're smaller than way like the light, so we have no way to really observe them. But that is a problem point, so you can go back and watch them at home too. Okay. Yeah. So what we can do is actually tell you about the molecules. We don't really have a direct way of showing you the molecules. One way around this is to draw pictures. And this idea is actually nothing new. Scientists have always created pictures as part of their thinking and discovery process. They draw pictures of what they're observing with their eyes through technology like telescopes and microscopes, and also what they're thinking. I think two well-known examples because they're very well known for expressing science through art. And I start with Galileo, who used the world's first telescope to look at the moon. And he transformed our understanding of the moon. The perception of the 17th century was the moon was a perfect heavenly sphere. Yeah, hard on what Galileo saw was a rocky, barren world, which he expressed through his watercolor painting, particularly when DNA is being copied. And so what I'm about to show you is an accurate representation of the actual DNA replication machine that's occurring right now inside your body, at least 2002. Uh, biology. So DNA is entering the production line from the left hand side, and it hits this collection, this miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA strand and making an exact copy. So DNA comes in and hits this blue donut shaped structure, and it's ripped apart into its two strands. One strand can be copied directly, and it's in CBC. <laughs> Things aren't so simple as the other strand because it must be copied backwards. So it's thrown out repeatedly in these loops and copied one section at a time. About a semester's worth of biology, and I've got seven minutes, so <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that today. No, I'm being told no. Um, this is the way a living cell looks in a light blood microscope, and it's been filmed under time lapse, which is why you can see it. You can look at the couple of breaks down. These thoughts are saying things are the chromosomes, we'll focus on them. So they go through this very striking motion that is focused on these little red spots. When the field cell feels it's ready to go, it's the same window. One set of DNA goes to one side, the other side gets the other set of DNA, identical copies of DNA, and then the cell splits down the middle. And again, you have billions of cells undergoing this process right now inside of you. Now we're gonna rewind and just focus on the chromosomes and look at its structure and describe it. So again, here we are at that equator moment. And if we isolate just one chromosome, we're gonna pull it out and have a look at its structure. So this is one of the biggest molecular structures that you have in at least as far as discovered so far inside of us. So this is a single chromosome and you have two strands of DNA in each chromosome. One is bundled up into one sausage, the other strand is bundled up into the other sausage. These things that look like whiskers that are sticking out from either side are the dynamic scaffolding of the cell. Uh, they're called microtubules, that the name's also important. But what we're gonna focus on is this red <laughs> The dynamic scaffolding in the chromosomes. It is obviously central to the movement of chromosomes. We have no idea, really, as to what's achieving that movement. We've been studying this thing called the kinetic core for over 100 years with intense study, and we're still just beginning to discover what it's all about. It is made up of about 200 different types of proteins, thousands of proteins. So fast, good. It's crazy. It is a signal broadcasting system. It broadcasts through chemical signals, telling the rest of the cell when it's ready, when, when it feels that everything is aligned and ready to go uh, this, for the separation of the chromosomes, it is able to couple onto the growing and shrinking microtubules. It transiently, it's, it's, it's involved in the growing of the microtubules and it's able to transiently couple onto them. See, right now it's still the plus end because it's growing as you speak. You see that, right? It's turning green here because it, it feels that everything is just right. And you see that this one little last bit that's still remaining red. And it's walked away down the microtubules. That is the signal broadcasting system, sending out the stop signal, and it's walked away. I mean, that's mechanical. It's molecular clockwork. This is how you work at molecular scale. So, with a little bit of molecular eye candy, um, we've got kinesins, which are the orange ones. They're um, like the courier molecules walking one way. And you see what they're They're carrying that red broadcasting system, and they've got their long legs so they can step around obstacles and so on. So, again, this is all derived accurately from the science. The problem is we can't show it to you any other way. 
Exploring at the frontier of science, at the, at the frontier of human understanding, is mind blowing. Discovering this stuff is certainly a pleasurable incentive to work in science. But, but most medical researchers, but here you saw how it was polymerizing all throughout that time. Because remember, I told you that those kinetic or microtubules were still dynamic, so they were still continuously working. When that signal comes that, okay, no more, it shifts. And now it is depolymerized. And they come apart. And as they come apart, it moves, shifts that ring up the end. That's why it, I called it the minus end, because at that point, it's no longer polymerizing. It is only depolymerizing on that side. Interesting. It is crazy. It is crazy. So cool. Think about it. This is what's happening inside. It's like a whole world down there. <laughs> whole world. <laughs> yes. Very different world. Okay. Oh, it's not moving. So just to recap on microtubules, they are hollow tubes with structurally distinct plus and a minus end. The cytosome is the major organizing center in animal cells. Um, these display dynamic instability. So any one of these, unless they're anchored to some type of a protein protecting those ends, is going to be going through a plus or a minus shift constantly where it's polymerizing or depolymerizing. It is just driven by the GTP hydrolysis because the new tubulin type dimers that are coming in are with GTP bound. And when they depolymerize, it's because of the GTP hydrolyzation. Um, this can be modified by drugs, always, right? We use drugs to change it around to make it do what you want it to do uh, at times. And they are very much responsible for organizing the cell interior for movement of molecules, organelles, and vesicles from one place to another, and also for movement of cells themselves in their space. Um, with cilia and flagella, they have stable microtubules. Those microtubules are no longer moving, right? They, are, they do not have a plus or minus end the same way. Those are stable microtubules, and their movement is completely controlled by dynin, shifting it, sliding them up and down with the help of linker proteins. So finally, I think we have about 10 minutes, so we should be able to get our two minutes. Two minutes. Well, why do I see 10? I'd rather be in that other class in 10 minutes. I got you. Me too. So I will get you started on actin. I will say that um, I will finish some of that part next lesson, but I will post a mini lecture on the muscle contraction. So you will be responsible for it on your own. So that next time we can focus on cycle for majority of the lesson. Okay, so actin. Actin filaments are going to help our animal cells make different shapes. And it controls a lot of functions around that structural stability. So it controls when, you know, you have those cilia to keep them, those, any kind of pseudopods and uh, where they will be and how they will go. It is involved in cell cycle during, mid, you know, production of those two individual cells by restricting that at that cytokinesis point. So there are lots of things that it does. Actin filaments are much thinner than any of the other filaments that we've looked at so far. They are very flexible protein threads, and they are made of, again, a globular protein. Actin monomer is these, like, they look like two little globules together, but that's a single monomer. And actin filaments are made up of a lot of them coming together to create long structures. And then typically you have uh, two of them bound together to create rope-like structures. They also have a plus and a minus end, just like microtubules did. At the plus end, these more monomers are going to be coming in, and minus end, they're going to be coming away. Same idea, but they are only 10 nanometers wide as compared to microtubules. Remember, it was 25 micrometer in its hollow center, so they were a lot bigger. Actin monomers are going to be through ATP hydrolysis as opposed to microtubules where it was GTP driven. 
So <clears throat> at the plus end, you are going to have new actin monomers coming in. At the minus end, you are going to be losing your uh, actin monomers. Okay, um, so this again, this was your GTP tubulin, right? And the GTP cap at the plus end um, for the microtubules here, it is different. Uh, and in this case, you are doing this by utilizing ATP. So it's actin bound with ATP that comes in at the plus end. Again, the plus end will have some of these ATP bound, um, you know, actin monomers stuck together that defines the plus end. And on the minus end, you will have those hydrolyzed ATP molecules uh, in the, with ADP bound that would be moving out, okay? Um, so yes, if you lose the GTP cap, right? So they polymerize very similarly, the actin and uh, tubulin. At the GTP tubulin, if the GTP cap is completely lost, it leads to catastrophic shrinkage where the whole microtubule at that point goes away. And then it has to be reestablished. The cap has to be reestablished to create that polymerization again. Now, actin binding proteins, they control behavior of vertebrate animals uh, by controlling how they're organizing the cell, organizing the structure of the cell. This is the last slide I'll do. Um, so you have nucleating proteins that are going to be part of your uh, structural components, right? Um, they can be, they will combine them together. You have severin proteins that will cut them up into pieces. Doesn't mean it's gonna not uh, make them into tiny little monomers. It will be smaller fragments that can then do work. Uh, they can be cross-linking proteins that bind to the actin to create Again, structures like lectin did in intermediate filaments. So they are creating these cross links to hold the structure together to create that scaffolding. And this is especially important in your cell cortex, in that outer cell cortex. You can have capping proteins that will stabilize them and bind them just like we did in tubulins. Uh, you can have side binding proteins, proteins that bind along the sides to protect its function in muscle fibers for contraction and relaxing. Uh, and again, there are other proteins that can bind, again, for its function of contraction and relaxation to muscles as well. So you can have bundling protein and sliding proteins that are all going to work together for that function. So we'll start after this on next lesson. But for the actual muscle contraction, I'm gonna keep that for an online I think I have like six. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I've got like six layers. So it's, I wanted to take more classes. So with 3,000. Yeah, do you want to just hit on I'll take the ones from there. Yeah. Less people came today, so they should get sticker for me. I know. Okay.